Well, it's great to uh, see you all this afternoon, and it's been fun to have fun together before we even start, and uh, trust that we can learn and enjoy the interactions here uh, with each other today. And thanks for allowing us to come from the Elkhart River watershed to the what watershed? Kankakee River watershed. And we'll talk a little bit about that along the way. But this is a picture uh, from where we live in Goshen. Well, it's about, a, it's about a mile from where we live, along the Elkhart River itself. Spring is coming. It's a wonderful place. This water, of course, is running north, joins the St. Joe, goes up into Lake uh, Michigan. And so this afternoon, I want to acknowledge that that land where we live uh, is home to the Potawatomi and Miami people, the watershed and the homeland. Uh, the area that we're in, we'll talk about a little bit more, that it's more primarily Potawatomi that we're in this area, but a lot of interchange across uh, this landscape. <clears throat> so when we talk about watersheds, we think about where the water flows. This is the St. Joe River. When I was working with undergraduate students, and we would canoe all the way to Lake Michigan. Uh, so from south of Goshen all the way up to Lake Michigan, stopping along the way. And one of the questions that we often would ask, and I'm asking you today, what do we know about the watershed where we live today? Uh, what do we know about it? Um, whose land are we living on today, and how can we pursue regenerative actions? So what I'm going to do today is to do what I call a case study, where I talk about things I have learned, how I've learned them, and then you can choose to take those things with you and apply that to your own setting, whether it's here at Cedar Lake or other places that you might live. So you'll learn from my learning, and I look forward to some questions and answer at, at the end. So way back at an earlier time period, before the white settlers came into northern Indiana, where we lived looked like this. This is what's called an oak savanna. So you have the larger trees, and because there's so much leaf cover canopy on the top, you end up with just grasses and flowers underneath it, a beautiful uh, system. So today we're going to talk about four different things, giving a little highlight to each of these areas. So we're going to start with a verdant landscape. The landscape where we live and where we are here today was just amazing in terms of its vibrancy as ecosystems in lots of different ways. So on an oak savanna, Try with me to imagine 1830, right? So what was, what was going on in 1830 in a savanna like this? Well, in 1830, some guys came along and they put a post right there. And that post was, and they put many posts across the landscape, but it was the corner of a section. So it's a section corner. A section is one mile by one mile square. And it's how all of our area across northern Indiana and much of the U.S. ended up being laid out in this way. And one of the things they did is they would always measure from that post to two different trees. And they would write down what the distance, the length was of each of what are the arrows in my photograph. So they would know that if something happened to that post, they could come back and do that to measure, bring those chains together and say, oh, that's where the post is supposed to be. And those posts happen to be where the county surveyors still know that that is the section corner. The posts are long gone. Well, here's where Becky and I live. This is our house right here. Here's the orchard that Julie was talking about. And this is a very busy street called Kircher Road or County Road 38. And this is Main Street running through Goshen. So guess what? They set a post right there. Now, it's not there anymore, nobody runs into it, <laughs> but that is where the post used to be. And the reference trees, of course, happen to be gone as well. So today we use uh, geographical information systems, right? GIS programming to be able to know where all these are, but they're still different places of reference. So how do we know? Well, some of you know how to read cursive writing, <laughs> right? Uh, so, I went to the Elkhart County, so we're in Elkhart County, Indiana, uh, and so I went to the county surveyor's office and I was working with them and I discovered they had two big journals, 500 and some pages of handwritten notes that the surveyors wrote into every night after they did their work during the day. And th these were men writing like this. 
uh, just, it just so happened to be all men running these crews, right? And so what we see here is we see a section corner 21, 22, 27, and 28, and we happen to live in section 22, and it says that there is a white oak tree uh, that is 12 inches in diameter, and another white oak tree that's 20 inches in diameter. They measured it at about this height. They put a um, tape around it. They measured it so that they would know the diameter uh, of the tree. And they say it was level land, second-rate timber, with some understory um, growing along the way. And then they start heading to the east. And as they head to the east, they note that they entered the prairie. So they're marking down these different kind of what we would call ecological features, the different kinds of trees that would be right uh, in their way. So they enter a prairie at 25 chains. Anybody in here ever measure with chains? Hmm. So a chain happens to be a, an official length of 66 feet. Can you imagine? Like, if you were going to make something a certain length, why would you make 66? <laughs> nice round number. It's a, it's a nice round number. Because when you take, you see the number 80 over there? Yeah. When you take 80 times 66, here's your math problem for the day, 5,280, mm. which is a mile, yeah. right? So 80 chains, and they literally would pull these chains out, pull it out, pull it out until they got to the next mile mark. So they had to go across at 80 um, times. Here's halfway across at 40, you see. And there were 100 links in each chain. So that's why you see, uh, like at the bottom, it says 79.86. So it, that it would be 86 of the 100 links in the chain is where they were. Pretty good precision, right, uh, in that system. So <clears throat> then they drew up a map back in 1830 that shows us, so here again is where we live. What do you see here? It says the Elkhart Prairie. So they were walking along and they put a mark when they entered the prairie uh, right here. Some artists drawing stuff on here. A mile to the north is Goshen College and this now is called College Avenue. So they started out here at this point and they started walking, measuring for a mile. And after they had gone 40, uh, 41 chains, they came to a road to Fort Wayne. This is 1830 when they are noting this. The road to Fort Wayne was actually the Potawatomi Miami Trail. So they called it a road to Fort Wayne because that's where it went. And going the other direction to the northwest, it ended up at Fort Dearborn or Chicago or Lake Michigan, all in that same area. And so it's very interesting to go back to these records. And on my computer, I have all 500 and some of those pages. We're not going through those today. Uh, and it's fun to sometimes figure out uh, what they mean. So when I come back to this map of where we live, and we think about what they found here, this is all prairie. This is a major retirement center that's all inside the prairie. So when I talked on that campus of, to a group of people, they say, oh, it goes right through my building. So this blue line is the trail system that's running across. Mm -hmm. So let me just step back a little bit and say, how do I get interested in this? And I'm just going to tell you one of the particular reasons or why, reasons why I do. And that is because in, in 2013, Becky and I bought this acre that you see here. Our house is over here. And this was just an open lawn space for decades. And so we bought this piece of ground and I started to plant a fruit nut and berry orchard. And this ground, I was digging lots of holes you can see, right? And I ended up putting up trellises and all those sorts of things. And I kept thinking, well, this is amazing soil I'm digging in, right? Every time I dig down, I have this much topsoil and then I have a little gravel and I have this sand that just percolates. It, it takes the water really well. Perfect for growing things, 2013, 2020, same spot. And I don't have a picture from 2022 yet, but things are blooming out there right now. And I love working out there. So I'm out there working on this amazing land, and I'm asking questions along the way. And so I talked to a friend, and I said, what do you know about this? And he had worked in survey work, and so one day at breakfast he shows up, I kind of forgot about it, and he lays a whole folder down on my table, uh, on the breakfast table, and says, here, these are the abstracts for your property. So what you see up here is 1831. This is the first time this property was ever sold. 
by the U.S. government. No one had ever purchased this land before. And so you can read all the details on this, and then on the next page it's like, oh, signed by President Andrew Johnson. Now, this is an abstract, so you don't have his actual signature, and you have people who would sign for him, but this was in the era when he was the President of the United States. And so this was fascinating. I kept digging and I kept finding more and more maps and realizing the more and more details about Potawatomi and Miami people. And so here's a picture I took of our orchard uh, and I put up a little sign just to help people. There's a bike trail, like I'm right behind me on this picture is a, a walking and bike trail. So people going by there can be reminded that, you know, I'm not the first person to have ever gardened here, right? This was an area that was an amazing place for the Potawatomi in Miami to raise food, and I'll show you a little bit more about that. <clears throat> so here's all of our town, uh, Elkhart Township in 1830, and you can see some of the places I've been referring to. There's downtown Goshen. If you go to the end of that arrow, that's where our county courthouse happens to be. And here is the prairie, I've shaded it in green, and here's the blue line of the trail that goes right through the courthouse property. Wow. So, and I can, I, I can see it on the map, but I can also go to all those journal entries. And somewhere in the state, these journal entries are for all of Indiana, in the archives and different survey offices that you can find them. I've been fortunate that the Elkhart County Survey's office, office actually had copies of these journals. Uh, and that they had turned them digitally so I could put them on my computer. So the Elkhart Prairie is an amazing place because this is where the corn, the squash, the beans, and other things were grown. And so we know from the record that the Potawatomi would set up summer camps out in the prairie. There's a pretty big space, that green area I was showing you. And they would have their summer camp, they would plant, and they would harvest. Uh, and get their food together for the winter. There is a great book called The Potawatomi's Keeper of the Fires by David Edmonds, who writes about the Potawatomi of Indiana in particular. And if we were to read all the way through this, you see that all these things are being planted and maintained. Wild rice was harvested, and I'll come back to that. Nuts, roots, berries, and maple sugar. And they, of course, then stored it for the winter time. And so they would set up their wigwams, they would work with the river systems, they would have their summer camps, a wonderful kind of thing. Huge amounts of corn were grown all across the region. So we're the European settler farmers that I'm a descendant of, right? We weren't the first people to do the corn because all corn in the entire world comes from the Americas. It's the indigenous people of North and South America, Central America included, that ended up selecting out of a type of grass to eventually have corn of all different types. And so corn ended up going to Europe and then to Africa, but all of it started here. And so the Miami, the Potawatomi, and you can name just about any tribe group um, in the, in the well, East Coast and Central Plains, uh, Central America that had that. Maple sh sugaring, of course, was important. And I assume that that took place around here at different times along uh, in history as well. The maple, or the, the wild rice harvesting was very critical as well. One of the things about wild rice within the Potawatomi history is that the Potawatomi, the Ottawa, and the Ojibwe peoples are all part of one larger family called the Anishinaabe. Right? So all three of those major groups belong to this one large family of indigenous people. And they lived on the East Coast, the Northeast. And in their prophecies, even before, any, before Columbus showed up here, they had a prophecy that encouraged them to start moving west. And they started moving west, and they went across the Great Lakes, and they said, keep, the prophecy said, keep going until you find the place where food grows on the water wild rice. Monoman is what they found. Uh, and, and a very important staple. I grew up in northern Minnesota. My Half of my classmate, classmates were Ojibwe. In the fall, they would all go with their families harvesting wild rice in our, our area. So I knew that. But Elon uh, Pochedli actually wrote an article last year about northern Indiana 
He is a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. He's doing his doctoral degree, and he surveyed all the old maps from all of northern Indiana here to find out where wild rice used to grow. If you want to really know about that, send me an email and I can send you a link to his article. It's very fascinating. So this whole food system was so important. Uh, it's important for us also to understand that when we think about land, when I think about land, and when an indigenous person thinks about land, they often think about it differently. And Sherry uh, Mitchell actually wrote this, these statements that I'm going to put up here, and she notes two major things from an indigenous point of view. So that's Pot Potawatomi, Miami, Shawnee, I mean, you can name the tribe. They often will talk about how everything is their relative. <clears throat> So you notice in yellow it says everything is interconnected and in interdependent. If I were just reading that sentence, I could think I'm reading out of an ecology book. But she's writing out of a worldview, a way of understanding the world that they understood everything was connected for a long time. A second thing that she notes, and other authors write about this too, is that land is seen as kin. So a relative. So land is a relative. After all, all our food came from the land, right? I mean, you can just kind of start thinking with this. And she says, we have an obligation to care for the land in the same way that we would care for our human relatives. So when they were asked to sign a treaty where the government was going to pay them something for the land or all of these trades, it really didn't make much sense because it's all my relatives, the land is kin, why would I sell a relative? You might have really been mad at your sister one day and you wanted to see her go. But no, you wouldn't really sell it, right? And the same is true of land then. So when we think about some of the topics we're talking about today, this is an important thing. Um, Kyle White is a professor up at the University of Michigan, uh, does some very interesting writing uh, about indigenous people. He is also a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. And he talks about how the land is relative, and when we think about restoring or renewal, we have to think about the whole system. He says, in our seasonal round system, what's a seasonal round system? Spring, summer, fall, winter. And we think about that. I think about that in my orchard, right? You may think about it in your garden or other kinds of things you do, but you're thinking about the whole, as he says, the seasonal round system. So here's the Elkhart River. This is a pond that's right <coughs> along close to where we live. Uh, because of a dam that backs up the river, and to recognize that we all live on indigenous land. We all do, uh, here in northern Indiana and across the Americas. So one of the things that I've done, and I'm not going into detail here, but here's where I've done an overlay of one section. This is one mile by one mile. This happens to be downtown Elkhart, the city of Elkhart. This is the Elkhart River coming up. This is the St. Joe River heading towards South Bend and then on up to Niles, Michigan, and on up to St. Joe, um, where it goes into Lake Michigan. And so here I put around the side what the surveyors saw all the way around. I couldn't find that stuff for here, but that's somebody's job in this room to find this, right? <laughs> so that you know. So you can start pointing fingers, but I won't pay attention to that. But notice that this is a very active part of our county because of the two rivers joining, the confluence of two rivers, and the fact that we have the Fort Wayne Road coming here and the Ray Road coming here. Uh, very interesting to see that. And so again, drawing all this information off this wonderful cursive writing. So the city of Elkhart, so just north of where we live in Goshen, uh, where Becky went to, to grade school and so on. Uh, the founder of Elkhart was a Dr. Beardsley, Havilah Beardsley. And his son was about eight years old when they arrived in Elkhart to settle in, uh, in around 1830. And so when he's about uh, 82 years old, he writes an article and he recalls what he remembers as this settler boy where you have all the different beautiful lakes, you have the plums, the grapes, the pawpaws, the hazelnuts, the black and white walnut, just all these different things growing. And the forests and the chicken, wild prairie chickens, turkeys, pheasants, pigeons, 
right? All these things happening. Look what he says. So abundant was the wild fruit and game that the simple ones of the Indian were within reach of his outstretched hand, and he lived happily and content with the present and without fear of the future. And so he talks then about the confluence of the rivers and how the bands would come together. They would come to the islands there in, in uh, Elkhart, but they would do that other places along the way. Uh, this was a wonderful connection for that. Now, now here's a map you should now recognize because you know where you are on this map, right? Hmm. How about a right? here? So this same map is out here in the hall. Julie, I was so glad to see that out here. Uh, I found this one online and I could zoom in on it uh, a little uh, farther. Uh, but it's fascinating to see. See, these are all the section numbers on here, right? Uh, so we are sitting over here in section 26. I'm pretty sure we'd be about right there, right? Uh, section 26 uh, of, uh, what's the name of your township? That's center. Center. center, because the other side of the lake is yeah. 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 right. So it splits right down through the middle there. Yeah. So there we have. But notice this line coming down through here. It says it's an Indian trail, right? Where are the markers for that trail? Interesting question, right? Down here is the Peoria Mail Route running down through here and on up. Uh, to where it connects into some of the other uh, major systems. So it's fun to look in at this. You can also see the names of the prairies. So we have the Elkhart Prairie, but here's the Robinson Prairie, right? Um, Eagle Creek Prairie up through here. Here's Mound Grove. Interesting names to go back and look at. So have fun with these kinds of maps. It's right out here in the hallway, uh, and you can find it online if uh, you look hard as well. So that's just a quick kind of, here's a wonderful <clears throat> verdant landscape. So there are many disruptions and changes that happen. So a quick little history lesson to what was going on in the Americas before Columbus ever landed and the settlers that followed. So to realize that 16,000 years ago, we have artifacts in Ohio, Idaho, that show indigenous people living in North America, probably on the edge of the receding glacier very close uh, to it. 13,000 before the Common Era, or we often say BC, but before the Common Era. So you have indigenous people in California on Santa Rosa Island, 3,500 before the Common Era. Up in Alaska, you have people living. And then to realize that the Sumerians were in Babylon at that time. And like my history, I probably studied more about that than I did about North American history, right? And I did all my studying in North America, right? Um, interesting reminder. The Mayan calendar, 3,372 before the Common Era, and it's actually more accurate than the Gregorian calendar. They had sleep year and all this stuff figured out way better than the Gregorian calendar uh, did. And 1,200 before the Common Era, era there was the Olmec, so those are the people before the Aztecs, we're already living in the America. And then to realize that in 753 before the Common Era, that's when Rome starts. And we know, probably know a lot about Rome, right? Yeah, you should especially, right? I think, from what you told me. Um, uh, Gabrielle, right? I think I heard your name as well. Uh, so, you know, what's interesting is I, as a white European descendant person studying history have made a whole lot more references to what happened in Rome than any of these things up here. Just a good reminder to us. And to realize that in the year one common era, you already have these amazing irrigation systems in the southwest that irrigate the crops, feed thousands of people in that era. So let's just remember that there were lots of um, important <coughs> technical developments that happened in the Americas as well. If you want to read a book about this, read the book called 1491 by Charles Mann. It's a nice thick book, I mean, you know, or get it on Audible and listen to it or something. And so he goes through all these things about North and South America that we probably don't know about and helps us understand the picture bigger. Another one is by Jack what, um Jack Weatherford, uh, Indian Givers, with a subtitle, How Native Americans Transformed the World. Well, how is that possible? 
Well, for us to realize that before Europeans came, there were somewhere in the 65 to 120 million people in the Americas. It's hard to figure out the number and you see a large variation there, but the reality is there were lots and lots of people living here. And then, we don't have time to go into a lot of detail on this, but to realize that when the European settlers came, this population, what, whether it was 65 or 120 million, that population was diminished by over 90% because of disease. Death, right? So our pandemic we've been working through, it's been pretty serious. But compared, I mean, this was huge. So you would have whole villages where there wouldn't be a single person left living. Very or very few uh, in a lot of places. So just recognizing that sometimes when we look at history, we say, well, there weren't that many people here when we came. Well, guess what? Europeans were already here and the diseases started spreading already, and that's why it doesn't look like there are many people uh, that are present. But just a reminder that the indigenous people of the Americas had microagriculture, so that's like raised bed gardening, lots of details we can talk about. They had uh, macro environmental management. So the indigenous people of North and South America managed the landscape so that it would have food. Controlled burns, all, like the Elkhart Prairie, the prairies we just named around Cedar Lake here. There were controlled burns to keep the forests from coming in so they would have food, right? Food for the, the wild animals and food for the humans uh, and be able to grow in that. So while in Europe, we were domesticating animals right, so we could have food. Here they were managing the whole landscape. It's a very interesting topic that you could read more about. So sustainable architecture with passive solar water capture systems, humanities of all different kinds. We have sciences of all different kinds, including healthy waste disposal, right? So when, when the first explorers would come into major cities, like around Mexico, what's now Mexico City, they would discover better sewage systems than anybody had in Europe. And so those cities didn't smell as bad as Paris did, right? Because of a better waste management system. They had all kinds of urban planning, they had a democratic government, they had complex peacemaking strategies. That doesn't mean there wasn't tension, but they had strategies that are pretty significant. And then finally, to realize that 60% of the food we eat in the world today originated, not just corn, but many other things originated in the Americas. So, should we pick on Italy? <laughs> <laughs> so, when we think about food in Italy, we think about tomatoes and peppers, right? No. You have more than that. What? No, I know, but it, that's something we often think about, right? Because you put it on pizza. It's, well, yes, and lots of other things, right? And. But it didn't come from Italy, right? Mm -hmm. It's wonderful that Italians have developed and chosen and selected different varieties and wonderful tastes, but where did it originate? So just again, kind of this reminder, here we are in northern Indiana. Uh, we see corn, but we see that there are other things being brought in from across the continent that were part of the trade systems, and those things were being traded on these roadways, these trail systems we're talking about. To realize that there was a lot of disruption that happened, and so the red arrows here are the Iroquois from what's now New York area, pushing other indigenous people west, because the Iroquois were hired by the Dutch to be able to get beavers, hence the beaver wars. And so our whole area was impacted. So there had been some French in this area before, but then as the Iroquois pushed in, then the Potawatomi and Miami ended up over, uh, over here, on the west side of Lake Michigan, close to Green Bay and other places, like into Iowa, Wisconsin, et cetera, uh, Illinois. So you, you had this disruption, and then when the wars end, then the Potawatomi came back again to this area. The Miami came back uh, a little bit south of us and on toward Fort Wayne, a little bit further to the east and south of us. And so to recognize, you know, here's another one of those maps that shows, you know, here we are in Porter, or in Lake County, uh, over, uh, down here, or in that, there, right about here, uh, there's Crown Point. Uh, and here's Goshen, where we live. We drove across here, crossing the Kankakee multiple times today uh, on the way over, because I love to look at watersheds. <laughs> Aspect. Where'd all the water go? Yeah, anyway. <laughs> 
So, and here's a closer look. So, so here we see this road coming down from Chicago, going across here. And actually, if we were still had the, this um, this map up, here's this road coming right by our house up into here, joins that road. So major roadways, and back in three, which room that was, Julie, that we looked at a map uh, that shows some of those roadways. Okay, let's jump ahead in history a little bit here. Do you remember when the Revolutionary War stopped? Hmm. Well, 1776 is the date we remember, right? Because independence, but then the war builds and goes on, obviously. Uh, because of the independence. So it wasn't until 1783-4 uh, that the war ends. The U.S. government, the brand new U.S. government, is in debt because of fighting the war, right? So they owed money to the wealthy in New England, they owed money to the government of France, and by 1787 they're saying, where's our money? Can you pay us back? Well, this happens to be the bank from which they paid it back right here. It's called the Northwest Territory. And I know you don't see Oregon and Washington there, but it's the Northwest Territory because it's north of the Ohio River, right, and to the west to the Mississippi River. All right, so these are the areas, and the states are outlined now, so you can kind of see uh, where these are. So that's why, <coughs> as the government then started selling land, they started uh, laying out all these sections. So like here you can see all these sections, right? In, in Elkhart Township of Elkhart County where we live. Uh, and they were selling, you know, it for about a dollar, dollar and 25 cents an acre. And by the end of, well, the end, it was, they continued to sell during um, President Andrew Jackson's era. It, it was only during his presidency, by selling this indigenous land taken by treaty, most of it, uh, taken by treaty, was the only time the U.S. government was not in debt. But then we got back in debt again. And keep that going, right? So there, there you see, here's this trail. So there's the Elkhart Prairie. So this road, this route, is the route then that the settlers use. In fact, in 1812, there was also a war, right? The War of 1812. And so down in Fort Wayne, there was a skirmish and they were not happy with what the Potawatomi had done, so they sent a troop up this road. It took them two days to walk, because the U.S. Army took their horses and said, we're using those for something else. You guys are walking up there, but you're going up here to what's called Five Metals Village. You see his name, Wanashana, uh, this, the, this little village of Abenabi. And they <clears throat> burnt that down in September of 1812. The Potawatomi people left this village and headed toward Detroit to escape. But when these army men showed up here at this village uh, and burned it down, they found that the food was still warm on the fires. And it was September, so there was a lot of corn, there were a lot of potatoes that had already been harvested, and the men took as much as they could. And so they then camped overnight, and Colonel John Jackson, as his name, he was not a colonel at that time, but he was in that group. So he slept on the prairie, he looked out across and he said, if the government ever chooses to sell this, I'm going to buy it because it's beautiful. And he came back and he did buy the land he was looking at. And that whole township is called Jackson Township. And he probably was sleeping on the hill that we now call Jackson Cemetery. So this road brought all kinds of people. Here is the Elkhart River. And US 33 is right to my back when I'm taking this picture. And on this plaque it says this is where the old Ford was, which was the gateway of the pioneers into Elkhart County. Well, guess what? That's a true statement. But not fully true. Because people had crossed this for millennia on the trail, long before the settlers ever arrived. You know this seal here in the state of Indiana. And so the seal is interesting, the original and what we see today. And in both cases, the woodland bison are being chased away, killed, etc. Trees are falling. This is obviously southern Indiana, right? So no. um, but the state was settled from the south. So here are all the trees that were signed. And so the lowest numbers, if you can read it, numbers on here, are in the south because it was close to the Ohio River. 
And they kept selling further and further north. And so here is where we live in Goshen. So it was tree in the record book, 146. And where we are today, that's 180. So this, I'll show you just quick snapshots of these trees. You all said you're good at reading cursive, right? Mm -hmm. We'll try that one on. Uh, well, we'll read it. Just <laughs> so this is a treaty with the Ottawa. Uh, but also, you'll notice that uh, the Ottawa, the Chippewa, or Ojibwe, and Potawatomi people are part of this. This is 1821, and this happens to be the very north edge, uh, the, the very north edge, so that's where this is at, and up into Michigan. Uh, so that was the 117. And so people go through this, they sign this. Here are all of the indigenous chiefs who sign. Uh, here's Chief Matea who signs here. Uh, here's a painting of Chief Matea. And let me just read a little bit of a longer speech that he gave when this treaty was being signed. And he says, as we go toward the bottom, we should incur his anger if we bartered it away. If we had more land, you should get more. But our land has been wasting away ever since the white people became our neighbors, and we now have hardly enough left to cover the bones of our tribe. Uh, and, and his plea for caring for his people was very strong there. In that same era, you have Isaac McCoy coming through, walking this same trail. And he also came over here into this area, looking. Uh, so he was a Baptist missionary. He went up to Niles, Michigan area, and he set up a site on the St. Joe River called the Cary Mission, uh, where he was training Potawatomi and Miami people. But he felt that moving people to west of the Mississippi was a good idea. And there's a whole book I recently read where it talks about how he and President Andrew Jackson and other leaders in Washington had conversations about this. They often would not agree. But ultimately, that sort of happened. And so this is where he, uh, this is, there's just a marker up there anymore of that carry mission. We won't read through this, but then this is the, the treaty in 1828 that was signed where we live. And lots of details. It's interesting that they say in this treaty that you cannot, an Indian cannot have land on the Elkhart Prairie or within five miles of it. Because it is such amazing soil for growing. Uh, plants and, and so on. Here's the treaty from where we are. Uh, so, so we're over here uh, in Lake County on that side. So th this is that same treaty that we were noting. This was signed in October 26th of 1832. And this whole area was signed the next day, October 27th of 1832. You see this little square right there? And that's where each of those rectangles are pieces that were left for various chiefs to have with some of their people. So Chief Menominee by Twin Lakes is there. And we're going to mention him again um, in just a moment. So here's the treaty, October 26, 1832. We're not going to read it. But if you want to read these things, it's, it's just a good reminder to read through this and understand what was going on. And you can see how much money was paid. And you can see Chief Menominee's land is, is kept out uh, there as well. And so here's this parcel uh, that we're talking about marked out in this, this map. And there were many such treaties. These are all with Potawatomi peoples. And the people, of course, are then forced to leave the area. Because in 1830, President Andrew Jackson says that we need to move these people, and we created, they, the U.S. government, created the Indian Removal Act. And he says, it was a measure I had much at heart and sought to effect because I was satisfied that the Indians could not possibly live under the laws of the state. If now they shall refuse to accept the liberal terms offered, move west of the Mississippi, they must only be liable for whatever evils and difficulties may arise. I feel conscious of having done my duty to my red children, and if any failure of my good intention arises, it will be attributable to my their want of duty to themselves, not to me. That's all their responsibility. So 1830. Here we have 1837. George Winter, a famous author, a painter, uh, painted a lot of different paintings, and here they're getting ready to be removed, and the trail of death then leads from Twin Lakes where Chief Menominee's village was, and this is the route that the 850 Potawatomi Indian were forced to march, 
with Chief Menominee in a cage during the first part of the trip. Over 40 people died along the way, most of those children. And there's a whole journal that you can read from uh, about that trip. And so scenes along the way that were sketched uh, as they traversed September all the way into November, terrible weather that they encountered along the way. And you see that there were many other ones. So the people from our area ended up getting down here into uh, Kansas and then being forced again down into Oklahoma, where the citizen uh, Potawatomi Nation ends up being uh, right down here. So here we are again, back to Cedar Lake. If you want to study, go back and find out the history of some of these people. And you know some of these names, perhaps, but it's fascinating to look back in 17, uh, uh, 1874 uh, closely at these maps. And then, isn't this a wonderful description? Uh, Julie was saying she enjoyed reading this. Here's, here's mine, right? The climate of Lake County is temperate and very sublurious. Sublurious. <laughs> Did you use that word so far this week? Yeah, I Ah, yeah, wonderful, right? Is that, I mean, or how would you translate it into English? From Italian? Uh, healthy. Healthy, yeah, good for health, yes. Yeah, good for health, exactly. Like salute, right? In, right. To good health. <clears throat> And you see the things that were being grown. So it's interesting to see the switch from how the landscape was being used by the indigenous people to the way that the settler people then started using this landscape. And again, it keeps happening. But you see, of course, this huge, huge area uh, of the Kankakee River that we could talk more about. So I've appreciated working with Dr. Kelly Mosseller. She is a descendant of people who were on that trail of death. Right? And she lives in Shawnee, Oklahoma, in that reservation area. Uh, so we talk by Zoom a number of times as she's giving some consulting information to us. Uh, she does a wonderful job leading the Cultural Heritage Center there. She's in her dance regalia. Another citizen Potawatomi Nation member, Sharon Hoogstratton, has a whole book of these uh, portraits of Potawatomi in their dance regalia. And in one of our Zoom calls, uh, Kelly said to us, uh, this is our land, is like here, northern Indiana. This is our land, it's where we live. It's where, uh, it is where our ancestors are buried and it is a place of our origin story. And she doesn't say this in a condemning way, she just says that's the, that's the reality, that's how we think of this land. And so working together with her has, has been a delight, as well as some people from the Miami and the Pokagon Dam um, of Potawatomi. So let's touch briefly on um, some root causes here. So one of the things that we have to be aware of is that when Columbus was coming here, there had been earlier explorers that had gone down the west coast of Africa. And the international governing body at that time had made some guidelines about what happens when you go into these new places. The international governing body at that time happened to be the Roman Catholic Church. Right? That, that's the way it was across uh, the Mediterranean uh, and up into Europe. And so the doctrine of discovery is something that emerged out of that and it gave this framework for what happens when you discover land. And the discovering piece is quite sobering because when you get there, you can seize these indigenous lands and dominate the people. Let's look a little bit more about the, what this means. Terra nullis, the land is empty. So the land is empty doesn't just mean not many people living there. It also means that if they are not living under a Christian prince or leader, then they are subhuman. All right? So this is documented. This is the understanding. Uh, that has been there, and it's influenced how I think, I'll be honest. I mean, it has an influence that pervades in so many different places, but sadly then, that becomes the basis for wars, colonization, and slavery. We talk about manifest destiny in, in uh, history classes. So here's John Gass's uh, painting of American progress, and you see the buffalo heading further west and eventually gone, the indigenous people moving, the pioneers coming, the miners, uh, the agriculturalists, you see the trains, you see the telegraph wire, and this woman's name is? You don't know her? It's not Lady Liberty. It's Columbia. 
Columbus, Columbia, right? Uh, so she, she was vying for one of these leading roles of figures, right, that we could use. And in this picture, he has that. So she has a telegraph wire in her hand, moving west. In her, this is not a Bible. It's a school book. So training people to think differently was part of it. So this whole view of a settler-dominating culture coming into a new landscape even shows up when you read about Goshen as a city on Wikipedia, right? You don't have to believe everything on Wikipedia. <laughs> but somebody gave this information there, and it says that Gosh Goshen was the name because they saw themselves as a chosen people, just like the Israelites in the Old Testament. Um, so, you know, it just kind of pervades this domination factor. If you want to find out some information about trees, go to, just all you have to do is on the internet, look up Invasion of America, and you'll come up with this map. Uh, this is not live, but it will do a little run through of all the treaties being signed as they work their way across the country. These, of course, are colony areas, and it works your way across the country. And then you can zoom in, and you can click like where you live, and it will show you the area and the name of the treaty, and there's a link that will take you to the Library of Congress or some other resource data bank that will give you the treaty for where you live. So I've done that for a number of places where I've, I've lived before. The Doctrine of Discovery even makes it all the way into our U.S. Supreme Court, so it becomes part of our laws of the nation. So for example, in 1823, as this part was being settled, out in Illinois, there was a dispute because one person, Johnson, had purchased some land from a Pinkishaw person to farm. And then another person came along, Macintosh, and bought the land from the US government when it became for sale. Now two people own the same land. So it ends up in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says, well, it belongs to Macintosh who got it from the US government because they had the right of discovery on the land. Not the indigenous person, the right of discovery. So it got transferred on. Even as recently as 2005, the Doctrine of Discovery is referenced in this court case where the city of Sherrill, New York, with the Oneida Nation, so the Oneida people purchased a bunch of land that was originally their land, so they got it back by purchase, and they said, and then according to historical documents, then we don't need to pay taxes. And the city says, oh no, you've got to pay taxes. Well, it ends up in the Supreme Court, Right of discovery, the government can say who gets taxes, not who owned it originally, and so they still have to pay taxes. So, you know, it just gets woven in so many different places. So I'll just conclude here and then take a few questions. And, and what do we learn? Like, what, what do we deal, how do we deal with this difficult history? Uh, it's a piece I like to work on. I mean, I, I like to think of it. I have indigenous friends. I have appreciated their input and help. One of those happens to be Dr. Woodley, uh, Randy Woodley, who's Cherokee. He lives in Oregon. He also has a little farm. He also teaches in a seminary. Uh, and in one of our calls, he shared this idea or this kind of paradigm, as he calls it, saying that we need to begin with awareness, the kind of things we're doing today, also learning from indigenous people. We need to lament the things that have not gone well and spend time on that, but then move into the rehumanizing, right? And as another indigenous person from Minnesota said in a call, he said, you know, it's not only the indigenous people who were dehumanized with what happened. The people who did that were also dehumanized. So our own humanity is impacted when we treat people unjustly, uh, which was a great point to think about. And then to memorialize. So how do we memorialize? How do we commemorate? Well, marking trails, putting up other kinds of markers, building relationships with people in various settings. Because the Potawatomi, for example, and many other tribes, are still here. And you see the, the various specific locations where Potawatomi uh, happen to, to live and have reservations or cultural centers and other arrangements. Learn how to do a land acknowledgement, and this is a resource um, that you can find online that helps you know how do you acknowledge the land in a, in a healthy way, um, and, and not just kind of put a little marker on it saying, ah, this was, you know, Potawatomi land. Uh, you, you need to work on it a little more deeply than that. Going to like powwows, uh, this will, has anybody ever been there? Not to, to a powwow. To a powwow. Yeah, so this, right, so very similar, but you know, this, we've gone up to uh, Dwajak, 
And it's such a welcoming event, right? So it's the indigenous people dancing in the regalia, uh, both from the region. Sometimes they have dances that include other tribes from across the country. Uh, just a wonderful, wonderful event. Or here in Shawnee, Oklahoma, is this place that Kelly uh, is the director of. And this website is phenomenal. So just you know, look up the Citizen Potawatomi Nation and on their website, uh, they actually have tours around the museum, and you can relate to this. I, I said to Kelly, I said, you have an amazing website with all, you know, all your displays are videoed and stories and other things. She said, well, when the pandemic hit, it was like, okay, what are we going to do with all our time, right? <laughs> so we ended up, you know, working hard on making this information out there. Um, so you could relate very directly uh, to her. Uh, this is from, um, here's, let's see, where do I have a website up there? Uh, so the, the, just type that one in, right? Got that. <laughs> but the, the Miami uh, people have some wonderful. Oh, oops, uh, so, so the Miami people have some um, website things that are very helpful in learning uh, as well. Uh, another thing that I've done. So Becky and I are members of the Mennonite Church and. Uh, in 2014, a number of us worked together forming a coalition to work on the doctrine of discovery within the church and beyond. Uh, and I think I had three or four emails yesterday from the group just about how we're working on things with the church, but we have other churches who are interested in other civic groups, etc., that are interested in, in what we are doing. Um, and so we've created some resources that help us understand the doctrine of discovery, help us understand how we can respond. Last August, we came out with this whole uh, downloadable document that shows how we can build relationships, stories of repair, uh, we call that. The other thing, uh, a year ago, I formed a committee. Um, people kept hearing me talk about this trail that goes through Goshen, and uh, I'm out there working in my orchard, the bike trail's right there. They say, hey, Luke, that's great. I, li I like what you said the other day. Uh, when are you going to start marking that trail? It's like, hmm. Okay, I guess I keep talking about it, maybe I should do something. So I put up my little sign you saw. Uh, but now I, I formed a committee, and this is the committee that now has worked with you know, Kelly Mostaller, several other people, to honor them. Uh, and so this is a, a draft of a sign. So you see like the Lincoln Highway marker signs or other major highways. Well, that's our idea that we will put up signs on private property where we can to get started. Uh, I'm working with the city of Goshen right now and some other connections that are going on. Have some kiosks with information uh, boards here. Um, just this week we started work, this past week we started working on the basis of our website so people can find out more information. It's going to take us a while, um, but we're making progress and there's some really strong interest in that. Randy Woodley uh, says, we all belong to a great community of creation and we are participating in it together here on Turtle Island. All those who are honest about what they see happening in creation have a great ethical and theological foundation for the pressing work of restoring the community of creation. So I'm calling us all together to work on that. So thank you very much. Okay.